This is Join Us in France, episode 335. I'll get it right this week. 335. Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent, and Join Us in France is the podcast where we look around France so you can connect to France as a destination. Connect with its culture, history, gastronomy, and everything it takes to have a meaningful experience in France. This week in France, we're celebrating the bicentennial of Napoleon's death. And so today, I bring you a a conversation with Kurt Weiss about Napoleon. I'm excited to release this episode because I've been working on it for several months and I will list the resources I used in preparing for this episode in the show notes. My guest, Kurt Weiss, did an amazing job helping me to summarize Napoleon's life and why he had such an enormous imprint on France. If you're interested in learning how France ticks and why, you will love this episode. And I will also have big news about France reopening opening to foreign visitors after the interview. If you like what we do here at Join Us in France, consider supporting us by going to patreon.com forward slash join us and by visiting joinusinfrance.com forward slash boutique to check out my cookbook, Join Us at the Table, my Paris tours on the Voice Map app, and this is new, where you can now purchase an itinerary consult from me. Follow Addicted to France on Instagram to see Kurt's photos of Napoleon sites in France. He's visited them all and they are beautiful. I'll post them this week. The best way to stay in touch with me and with the podcast is to sign up for the newsletter at joinusinfrance.com forward slash newsletter. This week I sent out a graphic that summarizes what and when will reopen in France and how travel is about to open again and things are changing fast. I'll keep you all updated via the newsletter. The 200th anniversary of Napoleon's death is approaching because he died on May 5th. And in France, a lot of celebrations are planned for the occasion. I wanted to mark the day by doing an episode about Napoleon and share it with you. Uh, and, you know, share with you the big picture about Napoleon as I understand him. And for that, I'll get the help of Kurt Weiss, who is not a historian either, but he loves to read about Napoleon. Bonjour, Kurt, and welcome to join us in France. Bonjour. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm really excited to get a chance to talk about Napoleon. I really love to do so. I'm, I'm sure you'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> so did I say your name right? Weiss or Weiss? Weiss. Which way is it? Weiss is correct. Auf Deutsch. Um, <laughs> but in, in America here, it's just Weiss. Weiss. Okay. Sorry about that, yeah. Kurt. <laughs> No I have worries. a habit of doing that to people's names. All right. So as you probably know, I went to school in France, but I have no memory of learning about Napoleon at that time. Was it like that for you, Kurt? No, um, I was kind of an odd child. Uh, Napoleonic history is not something that we really focus on in the U.S. outside of the 10 minutes we give to the Louise, Louisiana Purchase. As a kid, though, I played Napoleonic war games. Ah. And, yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, of course, being focused on that, you have to have a really good knowledge of the battles. And uh, when painting the miniatures, you really have to have good knowledge of what went into the uniforms. So you end up with a sort of strange melange of uh, knowledge about Napoleon. Hmm, that's cool. Well, okay. So I think one of the reasons why schools don't teach that much about Napoleon and is that it's such a complicated topic. And it's undeniable that he had a huge impact on France. I've published two episodes about Napoleon before. One was with a tour guide who specializes in giving Paris tours around the theme of Napoleon. That was episode 58. And the second is where I tried to explain why Napoleon is buried at Les Invalides in Paris. And that was episode 135. There is so much we could say about Napoleon. There are hundreds of thousands of books written about him. Um, today, we just want to get an idea of the man, what he accomplished, and some of the major turning points in his life. 
let me warn you that we're going to paint with a broad brush, but hopefully by the end of this, you'll have an idea of who Napoleon was and why you, you know, you'll see why he made his mark on so many places in France. So I asked you, Kurt, to think about five words that you think best define Napoleon. What are they and why? Well, actually, uh, you kind of tipped your hand and you gave me your five words ahead of time. And when you give your five words, I will say all of those are are perfect. I I think they're fantastic. So I came up with five additional ones. First off, a romanticist. Uh, people hear this and they promptly grow and they think about every bad Napoleon and Josephine miniseries that's made it to cable. But really, <laughs> uh, Napoleon was a romanticist. He structured an entire military com- uh, campaign around an, an invasion of Egypt. Why would you go to Egypt? I mean, it's the middle of a desert. You know, it's <laughs> he and he didn't really think about these things. He thought, well, hey, I'm going to be in Egypt. This is going to be fantastic because this is where life begins. Right. But. You know, it, he didn't really think all that through as carefully as he should have. And uh, also at Saint Helena, he admitted to having having set seven affairs in his lifetime. But it's pretty easy if you pay attention that you can find several more that didn't make it to his memoirs on Saint Helena. Also, if you read any of his letters to Josephine that he sent while on campaign, they're they're rather steamy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they were they were very much in love with each other. That's that's for sure. Definitely. Uh, word number two: fairness. Uh, Napoleon expected to be treated fairly, neglecting to remember that this is the Europe that was created by Machiavelli, and this was a real blind spot for him because he'd enter into these negotiations and come out with treaties, and he'd be quite happy with the treaties, only to find a few months or maybe a year down the road that the treaties would be broken, mm. and. So, you know, his expectations rarely bore the fruit that was promised. (laughs) And uh, another example is the feud that Napoleon had with Hudson Lowe uh, on San Elena. When he was finally exiled on San Elena, he was continually uh, knocking his head up against Hudson Lowe's rules, and he was quite unhappy about that. He felt he was in exile, not in prison, and... Mm. uh, uh, Hudson Lowe tend to treat him like a prisoner. Interesting. Word number th- three is order. For a guy who seemed to create disorder and chaos wherever he went, Napoleon actually loathed it. A good example of this comes early in his career when he commanded cannon to be fired directly into an insurrectionist mob on the, uh, the 13th of Vendemere, the whiff of grape shot. Napoleon detested the ongoing insurrection in the Vendée and went to great lengths to avoid having his armies fight in France because he feared that uh, there would uh, be a resulting insurrection. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Word number four, image. Like most authoritarian dictators, Napoleon used propaganda. He controlled the media uh, through Le Moniteur used outright lies to shape his public image. As he gains power, he controls his narrative even more. And unfortunately, as an armchair historian here, it really makes it difficult to uh, clearly get a a good picture of what happened because Mm -hmm. he's continually lying about his um, his deeds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, And and finally, endurance. The guy was incredible. While in campaign, Napoleon would spend long hours in the saddle with very little rest. We're talking days and days on horseback. At home, Napoleon was known for getting up early, uh, typically sleep only three or four hours a day. Even in his late 40s, he was able to march from Antibes through the Alps to Paris in only 20 days, basically half the time it should have taken. Mm. Some historians have questioned whether Napoleon was sick on the day of Waterloo Mm. because his command seemed very sluggish, and this might have been the case, but even so, he had just spent the last four days at Linney, had been riding through downpours, and, you know, he should have been a lot... He should have been exhausted. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's see. My five words are, number one, family. 
Napoleon's family is from Corsica, an island in the Mediterranean. I've done two episodes about travel to Corsica. That was episode 173 and episode 267. So beautiful, beautiful place and a fantastic island to visit. Over the centuries, Corsica changed hands between France and Italy several times. The local dialect is Corsican, and it sounds more like Italian than French. When Napoleon's father was born, his father was Carlo, so Charles, we call him Charles now. Uh, Corsica belonged to Genova, and a few months before Napoleon was born, Corsica became French, but the family continued to speak Corsican at home, so Napoleon learned French as a second language. Little Napoleon, or Nabulio, as they called him, was one of eight children. His mother, Letizia, was pregnant 16 times, gave birth to 12 children, but only eight survived into adulthood, five sons and three daughters. Letizia was 13 and Carlo 18 when they married. Napoleon's father trained in the law, but soon became involved in politics and fought for Corsican independence for, uh, from Genoa. But when the French won Corsica, he decided to remain on the island and work with the new French rulers. Napoleon's father was ambitious. He was interested in politics and he wanted to make a name for himself. So Louis XVI made Carlo a nobleman and he was elected as a representative for Corsica. So you can see that he was a, an ambitious man who, who did a lot in his life. The family was neither rich nor poor, but they weren't wealthy, like old money wealthy, you know. Carlo's untimely death at age 38 caused great financial trouble for Letizia and it's one of the reasons why Napoleon went to, into the military to the military school in France. As a young military officer, Napoleon made a steady wage, which he shared with his family. So the Buenaparte family worked like a clan, as did all Corsican families. After he became emperor, Napoleon placed his brothers in high positions and married his sisters to influential men. He surrounded himself with siblings and spouses of siblings. As soon as Napoleon graduated from military school, he began to make a name for himself. At the time, he was serving under the leaders of the French Revolution. As a reminder, the revolution started started in 1789 and ended 10 years later with Napoleon taking power. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about Napoleon's early victories? Uh, because that really propelled him into power. Yeah, so Napoleon first earns his spurs, spur, so to speak, um, gets to be really well known when he takes command at the siege of Toulon. He was uh, promoted way above his rank for this, and but did quite well. And then following that, there was the intervention at the 13th of Vendemire insurrection, the whiff of grape shot that I mentioned earlier. So while Napoleon was very popular with the general public and uh, the men ruling France, the directory, did not like him. He was very mm-hmm. ambitious and quite annoying. At this time, France was fighting against a Prussian-Austrian coalition in the east along the Rhine and uh, down south in Italy. To meet the demands of the public, they gave Napoleon a command, but instead of the very important and active German border, they said, ah, let's, let's find this little backwater where perhaps he might get forgotten. <laughs> so uh, Napoleon gets down there. He finds that the army is very poorly supplied, underpaid. Their morale is horrible. Uh, He immediately addresses the troops and he says, you follow me, you will earn riches, supplies, loot. And um, he follows that up with a very simple strategy. He focuses on moving his armies very quickly and attacks his opponents separately before they could congregate into a large army. Hmm. And this is what becomes kind of Napoleon's method of attack. Uh, He attacks and defeats the Italian army first and then uses the spoils he gains from that to pay his troops and equip them. They love him. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the first time someone's really paid good attention to them and, you know, welcomed the quality of their work. He then carries the war to the Austrians where he was able to siege. And eventually, the, and in the early next year, he takes the city of Milan. The Austrians are forced out of Italy and they eventually sign the peace treaty of Campo Formio. Napoleon's victory helps take attention away from the Rhine frontier because up north, 
that beautiful border war that was supposed to do well um, failed miserably, mm. and Napoleon's victory kind of ends up taking the limelight. And unfortunately for the directory, Napoleon is now more popular than ever. <laughs> So Egypt, on the other hand, that's a whole other story. Um, after Campo Formio in 1797, the directory is trying to find something to keep Napoleon busy and out of their hair. Uh, while considering sending him into the Vendée, Napoleon decides he's got an alternative plan. He comes up with this uh, this annexation of Egypt. It's been an idea that's been kicking around France for some time, and he takes it on. It appeals to Napoleon and France's fascination with the ancient world. It's, it's you know this this is the uh, the plum, so to speak. Unfortunately, the plan um, ignored the realities of the extended supply lines required to keep things going and also neglects to consider what it's like to fight in desert terrain. He right. just kind of thinks, well, it's, it's going to be like normal. Mm -hmm. After the uh, initial successes where he seized Malta and landed and successfully took Alexandria, they suffered a huge setback at the Battle of the Nile when uh, Napoleon... Uh, or, I'm sorry, when Lord Nelson sinks the Napoleonic fleet in Abukir Bay. Mm. Napoleon, the entire expedition, are essentially stranded in Egypt. And while on land, Napoleon was able to achieve several military victories against the Mamluks and later the Ottomans. Eventually, the expedition kind of stagnates. Napoleon gets restless. He's hearing rumors of uh, things happening in Paris. The, and he's feeling like he's starting to get left behind. And after a little bit, after a little, mm, after a year, I would say, in Egypt, Napoleon says, eh, I really need to get out of here. <laughs> and so in the middle of the night, he takes off. Um, yeah, he abandons his army. And uh, it seems that we don't hear a whole lot about that for some reason. Mm -hmm. I think that was actually contrived. Uh, the campaign continues for two more years after Napoleon leaves, but eventually the British have it lands and the French are ultimately defeated. Uh, all's not lost though. Napoleon had brought a large contingent of sci uh, I'm sorry, contingent of scientists to Egypt with them. And while the military campaign was ultimately a failure, the scientific endeavor was very successful. We see the birth of the study of Egyptology, uh, become popular in Europe and this stuff spearheads it right. among them. And among the many antiquities they take back to France is the Rosetta Stone, which allows us to finally translate Egyptian hieroglyphs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, well, the ba the military bit, uh, battles were not, in the end run, not worth the endeavor. The science uh, came through. It was kind of nice. Right. And eventually the Rosetta Stone ended up in British hands, which is why it's at the British Museum today. By 1799, it was obvious uh, to everyone that French people were exhausted by all the killings and the upheaval of the French Revolution, and they were aspiring to something new. The old monarchy tried to come back, but they failed. Within a month of coming back from the Egyptian campaign, Napoleon orchestrated a coup and put himself in charge of the new government of France, which he called the Le Consulat. And from the time he established himself as the premier consul until he crowned himself, uh, four years had passed. This was gradual, but still really fast. Napoleon was young and blindingly ambitious. He wanted to be the new Charlemagne who ruled over much of Europe, or maybe he was drawn to the idea of being like the new Roman emperor. Uh, what is for sure is that he wanted his son to succeed him, and that's why he called him the king of Rome. You know, an, a nod to the Roman emperor. He had the support of most people in France who were hungry for stability and progress. And because Napoleon wasn't, uh, he wasn't just hungry for power. He was also hungry for reform. He instituted the civil code, le code civil, that maintained all the things the revolution made possible. Nobility and clergy would pay taxes. Property rights were straight, uh, strengthened, even for small owners. So that was new. Regular people could get a legal deed for their property, and people can just waltz in and take it from them. He strengthened the civil ceremony of marriage. In France, you can marry in a church, but that does not count at all. What matters is your civil marriage. That was fine by French people who didn't want to return to the bad old days when the Catholic Church made all the decisions. 
Uh, Napoleon created French departments and he put a préfet in charge of each department. He created uh, the central bank in France and they created new coins made of solid gold. Uh, le Germinal et le Louis d'Or were the names of those coins and they are still worth a lot of money at auction today. Napoleon encouraged agriculture and food production, commerce and industry. Americans have this image of Napoleon as a warrior, but at home he was really busy remaking France. And France was really prosperous under his leadership, despite the, the never-ending wars. Napoleon's built roads, developed canals and river navigation. He created public high schools for boys only, unfortunately, and a new standard diploma, the baccalauréat. He made a lot of improvements to the city of Paris, and they included many buildings built to his glory. La Colonne Vendôme, two Arc de Triomphe, La Madeleine Church, two new bridges over the Seine River, Austerlitz and Inea, named after two of his military victories. At the same time, Napoleon was a dictator who only gave lip service to the basic freedoms established by the Declaration of Human Rights created by the French Revolution. Under his leadership, the police were all-powerful. They read your mail and watched who hung out with you. No more freedoms of the press. He rewarded people who served him uh, with a new medal, la Légion d'honneur. He also reinstituted slavery, which had been abolished by the French Revolution. He believed women should be pretty and make children, but also that men should respect women and not mistreat them. He encouraged the stereotypical French woman. She overspends on clothes and beauty products and makes men wait when, uh, you know, when they're supposed to go to a party or something. That's still the stereotypical French woman, by the way, and that's one aspect of my own culture that I really don't like. But Napoleon could not stand a woman who wanted to talk politics with him, such as Madame de Stal. Women should be beautiful and witty, but should not be. She should not challenge her husband about anything important. Le code, le code civil famously says, "Le mari doit protection à sa femme et la femme obéissance à son mari." So a man must protect his wife, and she may, must obey her husband. Having laid out, you know, all the good and the bad that Napoleon did domestically, given that he had many victories and many losses, could you tell us about one of his greatest victories? Um, and then we'll get to the losses afterwards. Well, there are several victories, but uh, probably, well, not probably, hands down, his greatest victory is going to be the Battle of Auschwitz. Uh, this takes place six years after Napoleon flees uh, Egypt. And a year to the day after Napoleon crowned himself emperor, it takes place near a small town in what is now the Czech Republic, but was part of the Holy Roman Empire, the Austrian Empire at this time. Auschwitz was the climactic final act in a series of battles that makes up the War of the Third Coalition. Earlier in 1805, Napoleon won several battles against a combination of Austrian Russian forces, uh, forcing them to retreat. Uh, giving up both Ulm and Vienna to Napoleon. The surviving army retreats and joins a large Russian relief force that's being led by Tsar Alexander I. And this forms a large, mixed, disorganized force. Mm -hmm. Napoleon, on the other hand, has kept his army broken up into smaller, more maneuverable corps. This is uh, Napoleon's way of conducting battle. Basically, it's like a large wolf pack working together. What happens next is basically a mix of excellent poker playing on Napoleon's part and some very precise timing and a little bit of luck. Mm -hmm. So the Allies basically were hoping that the French army would exhaust it themselves chasing after the Russians. The goal was not to stop and offer battle. And they had convinced Tsar Alexander that, yeah, let's, let's just let him exhaust himself. Winter's coming on. Eventually, we will be able to pick apart the French army. To avoid this, Napoleon it entices the Allies to fight him. This is the poker player. Mm. He does this by a mix of making fake gestures at armistice. Oh, please, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so weak. I, I really, we, we, need, we need to make peace. And to do this, he also uh, has occupied the battlefield at 
the Protestant Heights at Austerlitz, and he pulls his troops away from what appears to be prime territory at Austerlitz. The Allies think they've got him, and against the recommendations of Tsar Alexander's best generals, he takes the bait. And uh, he starts uh, basically to attack. This uh, all occurs on December 2nd. And they come off of the Russians come off of the Protestant Heights. I should say Russian Austrian forces. They come off the Protestant Heights and attack Napoleon's weak, supposedly weak forces. And what actually happens is the French counterattack with a fresh army that comes from behind and uh, offers a lot more resistance than the Russians were expecting. They basically hold down the flank there while they bring in the rest of their army from the other side. And make a long story short, they basically catch the Russian-Austrian army in a pincher move. Perfect double envelopment. If you know anything about military tactics, this is what every general lusts after. Hmm. And Napoleon did it perfectly. Hmm. The victory basically uh, is responsible for some huge change that now occurs in in Europe. This pretty much ends the war of the Third Coalition. There's still some fighting in Italy that occurs afterwards, but for the most part, it's all over. Hmm. The century-old Austrian Holy Roman Empire collapses. Austrian still survives, but it is not nearly the force that it was. Uh, there's now a resulting power vacuum in Germany, and Napoleon uses that to form the Confederation of the Rhine, who then becomes a very strong French ally. And there are now treaties with Austria, and soon after, Russia also surrenders. And pretty much all we have left at the end of the War of the Third Coalition is Britain on her own again, trying to continue the fight against Napoleon. Hmm. I can see why that would be fun to reenact, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Not in the middle of winter, no. Okay, I hear you. Uh, so what about his greatest loss? We, uh, he had many. He had many victories and many losses, but we'll just do one now, okay? Yep, and, and just like Auschwitz is pretty much hands down the biggest win for Napoleon, Waterloo is obviously the worst loss. Uh-huh. So uh, kind of set the stage here. Napoleon abdicates his throne, gets exiled to Elba in 1814. And that occurs on um, uh, in April of 1814. A year later, March 1st, 1815, Napoleon is now back in France and headed for Paris. He retakes power. Louis XVIII flee, flees out the back door as Napoleon's coming in the front door, basically. Louis XVIII heads into Belgium looking for protection from the British. In the next three months, Napoleon rebuilds the French army back into a world-class force. It pretty much had been kind of left to fall apart. And uh, despite Napoleon's protestations for peace, it becomes clear that the monarchs of Europe are not going to accept Fr uh, Napoleon as the ruler of France. Mm -hmm. War is inevitable, and the only question being is where is it going to happen? Do we want it to happen in France? Well, no, Napoleon does not like the idea of fighting in France. Uh, he's going to take it to his uh, nearest foes, which are the British and the Prussians, who are in Belgium. And uh, he then puts together this audacious ca campaign to take Brussels and defeat both the British and Prussian armies in the same old way, the divide and conquer that I mentioned earlier. <laughs> so on June 15th, 1815, the French army crosses into Belgium at Charleroi. They immediately encounter a small group of Prussian troops who start running away instantly as they, they're fleeing back to the main army. Napoleon seizes and he says, okay, I'm going to split my army. This is really not typical Napoleon strategy. He, he really does not like splitting his army. But he does it this time and he sends his main force down the road to Brussels, but uh, splits off this other force that's going to chase after the Prussians and he hopes – is going to be able to take on the Prussians under Blücher and defeat them. Uh, so the one heading up the road to Brussels is commanded by Marshal Ney, and the one going to Brussels, or I'm sorry, going to uh, Linny, which is where the battle eventually occurs, is led by Marshal Grouchy. But Napoleon really kind of runs the show for the uh, the Linny battle. Hmm. Both forces actually encounter more resistance. Ney runs into what he thinks is a large force of Anglo-Allied troops at Quatre Bras, 
And uh, while on the east, Grouchy finds the heart of the Prussian army near the town of Lenny. And these places are only a few miles apart, but um, the distance is is enough to keep the army separate. So on June 16th, both forces fight battles. In both cases, the French win a victory, but they're not the best victories that they could have achieved. Both armies are sluggish. They get started late, and both the... Uh, in both cases, the armies are allowed, the, the British and the, um, the Prussians are allowed to retreat in good order. Uh, in Linny, the uh, Prussians, instead of marching east to Namur like they should have, actually end up heading north. And this is because Blucher is ignoring the recommendations of his generals where we've seen that before and uh his generals are saying no you need to you need to go east protect yourself blucher says nope i've got i have to support the british i promised them and so instead he heads out north but this actually turns out a little better than what happened at austerlitz so june 17th the next day both armies are retreating through thunder showers it's just miserable lots of rain lots of mud uh, the Prussians are retreating north towards Wav, and the British are re, uh, retreating north towards a small town called Waterloo. General Wellington had scouted this place out before uh, he offered battle at Quatre Bras, thinking, if I have to fall back, this is where I want to fall back to. It's good defensive terrain. And so they're aiming to stop there, and by the 18th, the morning of the 18th, the Anglo-Allied the British Army, has formed up in a great line on a ridge just south of Waterloo, with Napoleon spread out across a similar ridge, across this big old valley of farm fields, just to the south. Napoleon's pretty optimistic. He's already planned dinner in Brussels. <laughs> but uh, Europe as a whole is holding its breath. Neither general had faced off against the other before, and both these guys are arguably the best field commanders in Europe. This is basically the 19th century equivalent of King Kong versus Godzilla, but I have to say, <laughs> much better, much better. Um, the battle starts late because the ground is still sodden from the rain. At 11 a.m., though, things have dried out enough that Napoleon uh, feels content to move forward. And what follows is a grueling full day of battle. A lot of back and forth. Uh, but at 1 p.m., Napoleon is startled when he sees the Prussians come on to his right flank. This should not have happened. Mm. And uh, so uh, at, by this time, both the British and the French armies are just beat up. They're like punch-drunk boxers. Mm. They're just, you know. And so now we have this fresh Prussian army uh, that comes onto the field, and it tips the scales. Mm -hmm. And the Allies get the strength they need to pull off the victory. And as evening is coming on, Napoleon flees the field while his most precious soldiers, the Imperial Old Guard, block any pursuit in a suicidal rearguard action. By the next day, Napoleon's back in France, but the writing's on the wall. France is going to fall. And now it's up to Napoleon as to how he wants to plan his final days as a ruler in France. Right. And this is where we get to the when he has to abdicate because he just doesn't have any more. Yeah, he's done. <laughs> Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah. Uh, so the abdication occurs on June 22nd. So it's just four days after Waterloo. But it's been a long time coming. And um, the fall really began three years earlier with the Russian campaign. It's been pretty much a downhill trip ever since. That was in 1812. Before 1812, Napoleon had experienced very few failures, but he's kind of like a gambling addict. He continues to up the stakes with each new game. Mm. And um, the stakes he wagered, unfortunately, in the Russian campaign were 600,000 lives of the soldiers that he committed to that campaign. Wow. So uh, as he's approaching Moscow in September after a very long trip east, He's got no idea that a month later he's going to be fleeing that same city. Mm -hmm. And by the time the French army makes it out of Russia, it's back on German soil. It's pretty much just a shadow of itself. This fantastic veteran army that Napoleon has built over several years is broken. They've lost over 400,000 troops. Mm -hmm. 
And those that were left are wounded, sick, starving. Most of their supplies, or weapons, or ammunition has been lost during the retreat. So Napoleon has left the army. He rushes back to France because he's heard, uh, again, that politically things are falling apart in Paris while he's been away in Russia. So he's trying to shore up his sagging reputation, and he also needs to start rebuilding what's left of the army and get supplies ready because he knows more war is coming. Hmm. Europe has his number now. They know how to fight Napoleon. They've learned costly lessons how to fight his way. In 1813, he's rebuilt the army, fought, they fight several battles to hold on to the German states, but at Leipzig, Napoleon is defeated again, and soon he's retreating into France. Uh, his defense of France was masterful. This is Napoleon at his finest. But unfortunately, the sheer tide of numbers eventually overwhelms him. Napoleon's marshals force him to abdicate to his son rather than see Paris burn like uh, we saw Moscow burned. Mm hmm. And the Allies then ship Napoleon off to exile on Elba uh, with a honor guard of 700, which actually turns out to be 1,000 troops. Uh, but rather than allow his son to rule, the Allies force the detestable Louis XVIII of the Bourbons on the people of France. Mm -hmm. So the rulers of Europe then set about carving up Napoleonic Europe at the Congress of Vienna. They start to have disagreements, and as things go... They, these agreements flare into arguments, and soon there's threats of war, and in the middle of all this saber-rattling, Napoleon wakes everyone up again, <laughs> because Napoleon has left, left Elba, and he left Elba for several reasons. A lot of people say, oh, he just wanted to you know, get back in the game. Well, really, he had not received any of the promised pay that the Bourbons had were entitled to give him. Rumors are rampant that the monarchs wanted to find a more secure place for Napoleon. Uh, maybe this little island in the middle of the Atlantic called uh, St. Helena or maybe a Scottish border fort, something, but not the comfortable life he's currently having. Mm -hmm. They've also denied his wife and child uh, the ability to come uh, join him on Elba. And uh, he hears rumors that the French people might want him back. They're not terribly happy with Louis XVIII. So Napoleon rules France from March to June of 18 in what becomes known as the saint jour the Hundred Days but France has changed. The people of France are more independent. They don't need a dictator anymore. Napoleon tries to conform to this new mindset and creates a more democratic government with the help of the uh, liberal Benjamin Constant. But after Waterloo, uh, this, the new government sees the writing on the wall and asks Napoleon to please just leave. Mm -hmm. On June 22nd, he abdicates again, flees to Malmaison. The Allies again refuse to bargain and insist on the, Louis, uh, I'm sorry, the return of Louis XVIII. Mm -hmm. So this uh, slowness and lack of urgency we see at Waterloo is continuing to plague Napoleon. He should have left immediately. You know, it's you've, he's got roving bands of Prussians all over the countryside looking for him with nothing more on their mind other than finding him and killing him. Mm -hmm. um, yet. He dawdles. He spends a week at Malmaison, and then finally, as things are closing in on him, he flees to Rochefort. But even at Rochefort, he spends hours and days sort of sitting on the sidelines wondering, well, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. And um, he, he rationalizes this by saying, well, I need a passport if I'm going to travel. If I don't have my passport, they're just going to arrest me. But the French government um, tells him, oh, your passport, it's in the mail. You don't have it yet? Really? <laughs> um, at Rochefort, he plans to get on a ship to head to the United States. But by the time he arrives at Rochefort, the British Navy have blockaded the port. Napoleon considers, oh, well, maybe I can sneak on a ship or you know, hide out in a wine cask. Uh, ultimately, this never happens. It really does not appeal to Napoleon's sense of dignity. Mm -hmm. uh, so on July 15th, Napoleon finally says, you know, I'm going to trust the British. But that's that blind spot again. Uh, so he turns himself over to them, and he is expecting that they're either going to let him proceed to America or at least allow him to settle on a pleasant English estate like they let his brother Lucian do several years earlier. Uh, British government's going to have none of it. 
after Elba. They don't trust him. The last thing they want is a Bonapartist uprising in Kent or some other such mischief. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, his request to meet with the royalty is denied. And instead, they send him from Plymouth to San Elena in exile. San Elena is a volcanic rock in the middle of the Atlantic. It's weeks away from the next port. It's approximately maybe 10 miles by 7 miles, and it is well known for its foul, wet climate. This is not the garden spot of Earth. Mm -hmm. Napoleon's first few months on the island are tolerable. He's allowed to mingle with the people. I'm sorry, he's not allowed to mingle with the people on the island, but he does have the company of the Balcom family. Um, uh, Mr. Balcom is an employee of the East India Company, and they give him a place to stay until the Longwood house is ready for him to move in. This is the, the home that they've found for, that England has found for him to live in. After he moves to Longwood, things become worse. Uh, his movement is more restricted. Hudson Lowe is now the governor of the island and insists that Napoleon remain under constant watch. And rather than allow himself to be spied on, Napoleon just locks himself indoors. The lack of exercise, harsh climate started to impact his health. Napoleon's health worsens, but Hudson Lowe refuses Napoleon's preferred doctors. And the people around Napoleon begin to note an obvious decrease in his health. And uh, to make things worse, in 1818, Hudson Lowe removes a lot of the people who were friendly to Napoleon from the island. He doesn't trust them. He wants them out of there. They, uh, he's got conspiracy theories run through his head thinking they're going to allow him to escape. Um, so in the final months of 1821, Napoleon fights his last battle against a debilitating stomach illness. And in his last days, Napoleon is so delirious he's not making sense. On May 5th, 1821, Napoleon dies from what appears now to be stomach cancer, although there's a lot of people out there who have conspiracy theories that he was poisoned or assassinated through some other means. But, um, you know, the, the facts seem to point pretty clearly to uh, stomach cancer. His father died of stomach cancer right. as well, so it makes sense. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of what ifs to consider about Napoleon's life after his abdication. Uh, he could have lived like his brother Joseph in the USA. Uh, Joseph moved eventually to New Jersey and lived there for several years. Um, of course, he could have also been in prison in a Scottish border fort, which is something that the British had wished, although, uh, after a little careful thought, they realized. Uh, putting Napoleon in the middle of the Scots, probably not the best combination. Uh, would Napoleon have been, <laughs> what's, yeah. yeah. Napoleon, um, would he have liked being a, a private citizen? I know he dreamed of it and he says, Oh, I just want to be a, a farmer and have a nice, quiet life now. I'm approaching my middle age and I want to live it nicely. I don't think so. Napoleon mm. hated mediocrity. He got to Elba, and after a few months of sitting on the Elba, he became very restless. Uh, same thing happens on San Elena. He gets restless after his first few months. He gets bored. Mm. So I, I quite honestly think that if uh, he had been anywhere in the U.S. or Scotland, he would have soon been up to some mischief that would have made the rest of the world nervous. Yeah, what do you do with uh, a guy like Napoleon? I mean, you, you know, you there's not a lot of choices, is there? Yeah, it's, it's kind of like a serious case of imperial ADHD. I I, <laughs> just, I, I think that's dangerous. Yeah. So I, I think the, the English are smart not to let him uh, land stay in England. Unfortunately, you know, what he experienced on San Elena was horrible. And, um, it, you know, it makes yeah. me sad reading about it. Yeah, yeah. Wow. You you gave us a masterful summary of Napoleon's battles. Thank you so much. So, uh, you know, I wonder how many of the listeners had ever heard that Napoleon could have ended up, you know, in the USA, um, maybe as a plantation owner, maybe as a, uh, like his brother in New Jersey or whatever. With you, I, you know, I, I'm with you that if that had been his fate, I'd I don't know. I can't imagine him doing that. And I'm sure he wouldn't have the sort of greater than life image 
that he has, uh, you know, to this day. Napoleon left a huge mark on France and French institutions. When you visit Paris, you could spend a day looking at the major Napoleon sites. Les Invalides, La Madeleine, L'Arc de Triomphe, at the top of the Champs-Élysées, L'Arc de Triomphe du Carousel, uh, by the Louvre, La Place Vendôme, La Madeleine. I should really write a voice map, self-guided walking tour that makes, you know, that takes you to all of these places and talks about some of the history. We'll see if I ever get to it. But anyway, thank you so much, Kurt, for doing this with me. I um, I couldn't have done it without you because it's such a complicated subject, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, we're just scratching the surface, as you said earlier. It's, yeah. Uh, there's so much you can talk about. Yeah, and I must say, I, I read, in preparation for this interview, I, I read four books, and I'm sure you've read dozens of books, and we barely, barely scratched the surface, so... A, gr- a great, uh, a well-filled life of a very ambitious man, for sure. Oh, and I didn't tell you my other five words. My, my, in the end, I, it was family, ambition, dictator, law, and institutions, because he had a great uh, mark on French institutions to this day, as a matter of fact. Merci beaucoup, Kurt. Au revoir. Je t'en prie. Au revoir. Again, I want to thank my patrons for supporting the show and giving back. Patrons get several exclusive rewards for doing so. You can see them at patreon.com forward slash join us. P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Join us. No spaces or dashes. Thank you all for supporting the show. Some of you have been doing it for many years now. You are wonderful. I don't have any new patrons to thank this week, which makes me sad, but it happens. My thanks to Cass McIntyre for sending in a one-time donation using the green button on any page on joinusinfrance.com that says tip your guide. Cass is also a patron. Thank you for being so generous. Another way to support this podcast is to hire me to be your itinerary consultant. I spent most of the week doing itinerary consults and improving my system. If you'd like to purchase a consult from me, go to joinusinfrance.com for slash boutique and you'll see the purchase button there. It's not a free service, obviously, but I think it's the best money you'll spend planning for your trip. Uh, Here's What one person I worked with this week, here's what she wrote. Bonjour, Annie. I cannot thank you enough for your time this morning. It was a pleasure hearing your voice and chatting with you about the country you love so much. I shared your doc with Nick. That's her fiancé. They are coming to France on their honeymoon. And we are just over the moon excited. Thank you for your details. I feel at ease knowing that we have a plan and are in good hands with your itinerary. So here's how this service works. Once you purchase the service at my boutique, I get a notification and I send you a form with questions about you and your preferences, your goals for the trip, your dates, obviously, some of the places you're thinking of visiting. And I also send you a link where you make an appointment for you to talk and we will review the itinerary for about an hour. And then... I get to work and I produce a travel guide just for you. I give you suggestions for every day of your trip, all the things you should not miss, hotels and restaurant recommendations. I warn you about the possible gotchas. I give you details about how things work in France uh, so you know what to expect, uh, things that I know have tripped up visitors before because I've talked to so many visitors on the podcast And I've done it myself, honestly. This is not a travel guide that fits on a napkin. There are a lot of details spelled out. Depending on how long your trip is going to be, you'll get 20, 30, 40 pages because there's a lot of things that you need to know. And after we've talked, I make adjustments if any are needed. And there you go. You're on your way to a great trip to France. We have an expression in French. Un qui sait... Vaut mieux que dix qui cherche. One who knows is better than ten who are searching. To book this, go to joinusinfrance.com forward slash boutique. I mentioned that I sent out a graphic about the gradual reopening of France to my newsletter subscribers. I made this graphic because it summarized things better than the lists, you know, the long list that I've seen, because of course it's complicated. This is France, it's complicated. I'll post this graphic on the show's uh, Facebook page and uh, Facebook group as well today. 
Things are going to open gradually, and foreign visitors who are able to provide proof that they have been vaccinated or have had a recent negative PCR test will be able to come back to France starting June 9th, 2021. And that's just a few weeks away. Here's how it's going to work. We're under a curfew right now. Everyone needs to be home by 7 p.m. On May 19th, that will change to 9 p.m. On June 9th, it will go to 11 p.m. So if you come to France as soon as possible, which is June 9th, you have the 11 p.m. curfew. And all curfews will be lifted on June 30th. The nonsense of not being able to go more than 10 kilometers away from home is going to be over tomorrow. Not that anybody enforced that really, but I'll be glad when it's over. Restaurants and cafes will be able to open their outdoor services on May 19th. And this is where I made a mistake in my graphic. I said as a footnote that there was no talk of reopening for indoor dining. And that was wrong. The plan is to reopen indoor dining on June 9th, which is the same day visitors can come back. But with such strict restrictions about, you know, how close the tables can be and how many people can be in a room that I've heard so many restaurateurs on the radio say, I'm not opening until all the restrictions are lifted. So if you've ever visited France, you know that we have a ton of really small restaurants where the room is small, the tables are packed in, and these people are barely making a living even with the room packed, right? So if they have to open but only serve six people at a time, it's not worth it to them at all. So I doubt that all restaurants will reopen on uh, June 9th. But by June 9th, all stores should be able to reopen. So, you know, your luxury goods, your... (laughs) Because so far it was only essential purchases. Now it's everything can reopen. The movies, the museums, the theaters, the conventions, the fairgrounds, the gyms, the stadiums, the sports venues, all of them will be able to open on June 9th. There will be restrictions on the number of people who can enter all these spaces, but they can reopen. The only thing that will not reopen and that we don't have a date for are discos and dance clubs. So if you come to France to go to a disco, don't. (laughs) Of course, all of these things can change if the pandemic takes a turn for the worse. Not every part of France has the same level of virus circulation. You can see the granular details on this fabulous site called it's uh, covidtracker.fr. It's it's chock full of information and you can nail you know you can drill down to uh, the, the the department level it's it's really good by the time this episode is released 24 percent of french people will have received a first dose of vaccine and by june 15th all adults over 18 will be eligible to make an appointment for vaccination let me repeat that by june 15th they'll start vaccination of all 18 and over in France. You've been able to do that in the US for six weeks or more already. So no matter how you slice it, vaccination rates are lower in France than in the US. It's not catastrophic, but it's not ideal. And it is possible that the pandemic will spike again. And that's what some math heads are saying will happen. But I don't know. I'm not a math head. (laughs) But the way it's going, it looks like by the time visitors can come back to France, June 9th, about half of French people will have received a first dose of the vaccine and about a third will have had both doses. I'm just eyeballing, you know, the projection curves here. But it looks to me like that's a That's a possibility. But still, it's only half of people will have had a vaccine. So it's it's, it's not that many, really. In the newsletter, I asked if my readers would be willing to come back to France, given the restrictions. And this is what uh, some of the a couple of the responses I got. Lydia wrote, dining in France is an experience, not takeout food. I know I won't visit until restaurants are open for indoor eating. So I wrote back to her and I corrected my mistake. Indoor dining will be allowed, but I bet a lot of restaurants won't reopen until they can fully, fully reopen with no restrictions. And that's going to take a while. 
Jim wrote, sure, I would visit France with a mask on. Most of the places we visit and most of the photographs I take are of beautiful outdoor scenery and cityscapes. If I had to wear a mask in a museum, it wouldn't bother me at all. So yeah, that's good. And Deborah wrote, this is an interesting one. She said, we arrived last Sunday and we're currently isolating at home until we get a COVID test on Monday. In November last year, we were granted an exemption to leave Australia, which still has a do not travel advisory for France. But also our government has a travel ban in place for all Australians unless they are granted an exemption. An exemption. So it's different in Australia. They can't leave the country, pretty much. Um, but, so, Deborah says, we have been waiting for France to reopen to Australians, which is a low-case country, which it did recently. We have a long-stay visitor visa. So they've been able to come back because they have a long visa. We had a negative PCR test within 72 hours of departing Australia, but the entire plane load was tested again at uh, CDG, that's the Paris airport, because we transited in Dubai. We weren't expecting that. This took two hours in the testing queue and then waiting for the result. There was a very angry, shouty French man ahead of us, putting on a show for everyone else about being inconvenienced. Yeah, you always find a French person to do that. There is much eye rolling from others who were waiting patiently. It's a pandemic after all. <laughs> we have all been inconvenienced to some extent. Our Pfizer shots are scheduled for May 6th and June 15th. We're so happy to be back in our home after 14 months away, even though it will be unlike any of our other stays in France. Wearing a mask and distancing is a small price to pay. And then she says, love your podcast and way, uh, I always look forward to the new one. Well, thank you very much, Deborah, and everybody else who responded there. I had many more responses. I'm not going to read them all. So it looks like, uh, there is a whole big range of responses. Some of you will come as soon as you can, even if there are restrictions and others will wait. Uh, some will wait a whole year. Some will wait two years. You know, some will n never travel again, I suspect, because they'll be worried about stuff. But the good news is if you have a trip planned for June 9th or f later, you'll be able to do it unless things really go wrong with the pandemic. There are countries where vaccines are not widely available and a negative PCR test should be enough. So if you want to come, you should be able to come. Show notes for this episode are on joinusinfrance.com forward slash 335, the numeral 335, where you can see a recap of what we've discussed, as well as links to relevant resources. For this episode, there will also be a transcript. I am considering adding more transcripts of episodes. I'll poll my newsletter subscribers and face group members to see if that's something you would be interested in. Of course, uh, transcripts are always good, but they are so much work, so, so much work uh, and money also <laughs> that uh, uh, I hesitate to do, to transcribe every episode, but it would be good to have, honestly. If you enjoyed the show, introduce a friend to the podcast and show them how to listen. Next week on the podcast, an episode about the gorgeous village of Pen with Elise. And I should have mentioned that if you want to come to France and not put yourself at risk, you'd be a lot safer visiting gorgeous medieval villages like Pen rather than Paris. I'm just saying. Until this pandemic is fully under control, it might be smart to stay away from large cities. <laughs> Send questions or feedback to Annie at joinusinfrance.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you join me next time so we can look around France together. Au revoir. The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2021 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.